Okay, um, welcome back, I guess. Um, <laughs> who was in our talk before? Okay, cool. So the first talk was all about identity server, right? And an identity server is all about authentication. So, you know, you want to know who the user is and you have probably simple to complex requirements how that happens, right, from names and passwords over federation, over business partner, B2B, B2C, or all kinds of, of requirements. So that's what Identity Server is really, really good at, right? It's, it's more or less a, a turnkey solution that, that implements the most common things out of the box. And if you want to implement something which is not so common, you have the, the extensibility points to do that. But once you are done with authentication, you inevitably will hit the problem, okay, so now I know who the user is. What is he allowed to do? Okay? And, you know, our customers were asking us, like, so can't you just build something else <laughs> like that? You know, we, we, we just put it in our pipeline and, and, and job is done. And it turns out that this is not so easy, right? Um, so since we had these questions over and over again for the last couple of years, so for the last 12 months, so we did an interview a, a year ago here in London and said 2017 will be the year we, we think about authorization, like dedicated. Yeah? And that's what we did. And uh, we, we basically started by um, observing how our customers want to implement authorization and, and how they do it and how they have done it in the past and how they would like to do it and so on uh, to just get a better understanding how that would work. Right? And always keep in mind there's, um, there's this problem between what can you generalize and what is so application specific that it doesn't make sense to generalize it. Okay? So it turns out authorization is hard. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so all the systems we looked at, yeah, we saw things like, um, you know, roles and permissions and uh, maybe ACLs, you know, access control lists, some, some, some you know, like, inspired by, by what Windows is doing, yeah, where you attach permissions or rights to objects in your database, things like that, with all the problems like orphaning and, and inheritance and so on. Um, Exacamel, has anyone ever used Exacamel? The extensi uh, extensible <laughs> uh, access, access control, control markup language, right? Um, I recently complained about that, that I, I don't want to formulate my business problems in XML, and someone said, oh, they support JSON now as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, so, you know, whenever I ask people, uh, is anyone using XML, I, I see one or two hands in, in a comparable crowd, so that tells me not many people are using it, and I think they exactly had the problem, they wanted to do too much, right? They, they wanted you to model business rules in XML or, or JSON. Yeah, but <laughs> the, the, the problem is you ended up with like sidelong XML stuff for a problem that you could solve in two lines of C-sharp code, right? So again, there's, there's a blurry line, I think, between authorization and, and business rules, yeah? And I think business rules are better implemented in the language and in the system where the business is actually being implemented as well, whereas other things can be externalized. And I think the, the only two things that we identified across the board of all the people we asked is uh, roles and permissions, right? Role-based authorization for more coarse-crained questions and permission-based authorization for more finer-crained authorization decisions, you know, where you basically have users, users are in application roles, and you map permissions to roles, right? And so you get like a, a you know, a, a multi-leveled, um, Abstraction, okay? Now, the, the architectures we typically work with um, look like this, right? You have multiple client applications, you have backend services, backend web applications, and typically when we are done, you will have an identity provider, okay? And uh, this identity provider, as the name implies, is for providing identity, right? Identity is something um, universal, yeah? So I am the same Dominic wherever I log into in this application ecosystem. So it's a very, tempting, a very tempting idea to now put all of your authorization logic into the identity provider, right? So we, have, we now have this central thing, right? And we have this new hammer uh, called claims. Now everything will become a nail, 
<laughs> yeah? And, and the problem I see with that, as I just said, identity is universal. I am the same Dominic wherever I log in, but permissions are something very, very application specific, right? So, you know, I, I might have different permissions in application A than in application B, but they all share the same identity provider. So, mixing the two concepts together of identity and permission will lead to problems. Yeah? I wrote a blog post uh, two years ago, I think, which, which was called like this Identity is not permissions. And I got lots of feedback from people agreeing and disagreeing with me. Okay? But to give you a really simple example, that's how I remember it, right? <laughs> on, my, on my national ID card, there is my uh, um, date of birth, right? There is no field saying he's allowed to drink alcohol because this rule is very application specific, right? Depending on which country I go to, to which bar I go to, the endpoint, the barkeeper, <laughs> yeah, will have a different interpretation of the date of birth claim. Yeah, so putting that on my uh, ID wouldn't make sense. And that's the same exact problem with this, right? If you're mixing up permissions and identity, it will get you in trouble, especially if your system is growing uh, beyond what you initially planned for. Okay? So, this is something I often see. Yeah, that, that, that's an example of how uh, uh, an identity token should not look like. Okay? So... We are, on the top, we have the usual stuff, right? Uh, it's um, authentication metadata, like uh, uh, who's the issuer, when did, uh, when did the user authenticate, how did he authenticate, um, and the audience, meaning at which endpoints can this token be used. Okay, keep that in mind, because that's the problem. Um, and then we have clearly identity information here, like the subject ID, yeah? the, 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 the unique ID of that user, maybe some, you know, name, email address, whatever you want to, you know, couple with the identity. Then we have stuff that is clearly authorization data, right? Like delete data, manage customer. Uh, that, that's all, uh, you know, around a little hospital uh, scenario we have from one of our customers. Um, can change the treatment plan, okay? And that is clearly violating what I think is identity and permission should be separate, for example, right? And then there's some, some gray area uh, in the middle, which are roles, okay? So many people use roles. In my mind, there are two types of roles. Identity roles, which come from the identity system. Yeah, so um, again, my customer from the hospital, they have exactly three roles. Doctor, nurse, and patient. And there is no situation where a user is in more than one role. Okay? And there is no situation where a doctor will be a nurse depending on where he's logging in. Right? They, they wouldn't like that. <laughs> um, so roles can be okay if they are identity roles. But if you're using the roles purely for authorization, then again, you're crossing that line of the separation between identity and permissions. Now, if you're coming from a WS star background, um, WS security and so on, the... The architecture was typically that you get one token for each physical service you're talking to, okay? In the OAuth world, that's different. You can see the audience claim up to, uh, on top here. You typically want to avoid having to make one round trip for each service you're talking to. You're, you're rather saying, hey, give me a token for API 1, API 2, okay? So what now if the user is allowed to change the treatment plan in API 1, but not in API 2? You see a problem here? How do you want to distinguish between the two use cases? Okay? So, I think that'll lead you to, to trouble. Okay? What about how many permissions API 1 has in API 2? That's the other thing, right? You, you, want, you might want to reuse the permissions between the different applications, but different users have, or the same user might have different permissions. Also, do you want to extend this token endlessly? for your 500 permissions, and then send it on every single request to the, to the API. Um, the next thing I, I guess I, I have an issue with is, uh, just go one back, oh. um, is how do you update the permissions now, right? So let's say, you know, your admin changes the permission to, you're, you're not allowed to change the treatment plan anymore. When will this change of permission be effective? Well, the next time you log on to the system, right? Because the, these tokens get created at log on time. 
Yeah? Windows has the same issue, where you, know, you log on in the morning, an admin puts you into, into some group, yeah? and to, 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 to make this group membership effective, you have to log off from Windows and log back in again, because these tokens get created at log on time. Okay? Again, I've, I, I don't think uh, a security token is a good place to put permissions. Yeah? It's, it's, it's clunky. Okay. Yeah, and then, you know, with this token, you go to different APIs now, and as I said already, there's a chance that the same user might have different permissions and different APIs, so I don't think this is going to work. I actually, we had to fix a couple of systems, like brand new systems, right? Brand new identity server, all new modern applications, but they made this mistake, and half a year later they realized, and, what, you know, it, it's very easy to add a claim to a token. It's really hard to get rid of it again. Because now, you, have, you know, a, a claim is a contract between the issuer and the consumer. And if you change the semantics or the existence of that, you're going to break stuff. Okay? So, you know, just don't do it. Okay, that's, that's what I said, I think. Cool. So, what we think, uh, you know, thinking deeply about the problem is that identity, AK authentication, and permissions, AK authorization, should be separated. Okay? Separation of concerns. We think the uh, identity should be the input to your authorization system, and what comes out of that will be the authorization data. Okay? So, basically, what we prototyped, so to speak, is a separate logical role, right? Um, there's the identity provider, which will provide the identity of the user. And again, this is universal, right? The, uh, regardless where you go to, you are the same user. But depending on where you go to, you will have different permissions, right? And that is a, an authorization policy, if you like. And there, in our mind, we think it's right to have a separate service on your network that takes the identity as an input and, uh, and returns the application-specific permissions for a user, okay? So, um, that's what, what we prototyped, basically. The idea is, um, you know, the user first goes to the identity provider, uh, does an authentication request, gets back the tokens, um, and then the application, for example, can go to the policy provider, send that identity, and can back, uh, get back the permissions for the UI, right? A, a, a UI has different, different authorization requirements or needs than an API. In the UI, it's all about, you know, enable this and disable that and so on. Um, so, yeah, this uh, will have different permissions than a backend service. So when you now call the APIs with this token, what the backend services will do in turn is they get to the, go to the policy provider and get their API-specific permissions. Okay? And the nice thing on top of that is that you want to have a nice um, management story around that, right? So maybe you, you have a management um, API, right, where you can dynamically create roles, permissions, put users into roles, assign permissions to roles, or a management UI where maybe a non-technical person, or you know, like a, at least not the developer maybe, can go and assign users to permissions and, and so on, and that should be completely separated from your actual you know, business logic. So, the broker and I sat down after we, we, we thought that this is the right way to go, from our point of view at least, yeah, and, and wrote the code, okay? So, what in essence uh, fell out of that are a couple of, of, um, of pieces here. First of all, um, a client library, something that you can plug into your applications to make it as easy as possible to talk to this abstraction, okay? Um, and then the client library talks to a client API, and the input to that client API is the identity of the user. Okay? And now in, inside of this client API, there's an engine that can now map the incoming claims to roles and map the roles to permissions. Okay? And there are a couple of things here. You can do a static mapping, for example, from the subject ID to a role, or maybe you have a rule saying, you know, if he is a contractor, he is, I don't know, goes to the, to the role external, for example. So, you know, and external has different permissions, you know, things like that. Um, so that's one thing. And on the other hand, there's a management 
API that allows you to do everything programmatically, you know, the, the whole management. Maybe you want to create resources on the fly, yeah, things like that. Um, so that's that, and obviously in front of that, there's the admin UI, okay? So while writing that code, yeah, we, we went pretty quickly, I think, from the idea to something we can show, okay? So if, if anyone has seen our NDC Oslo talk from last year, we showed the very first uh, prototype. We, we didn't have a UI, it was all basically, you know, um, JSON files by the time. We didn't have, you know, the, 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 the full thing. And we liked it, and we, we showed it to people, and they liked it too. So we realized to actually implement that, like really, really production ready, yeah, like with all the bells and whistles and installers and documentation and client libraries for multiple platforms and caching and all the things you would expect, that's a lot of work. <laughs> so I had to ask uh, Brock a question. Do you think we can afford another open source project? Yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so what we did is basically we took everything that you need to implement the, the pattern, right? The separation of concerns, the, the separation of identity from permissions, the, you know, like uh, sending identity somewhere, getting permissions back, client library, and so on and so forth. That is going live, well, it, it went live 10 minutes ago, or 15, or 20, maybe, yeah? Um, so, so that's on GitHub now, github.com slash policy server, and that gives you everything you need to implement the pattern, okay? So if you think this pattern is useful for your applications, having that separation, um, which makes it easier for you to grow in the future, just take that, uh, and, and there it is. If you want the advanced features like management server, management UI, client libraries for other platforms, you know, support for Redis and blah, 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 <laughs> you know what a, what a real product needs, there's a, there's a commercial product now uh, launched 20 minutes ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so for, for, this, for, for, for this talk, we will only use the open source version. So you see basically what, what you get. Um, and you can have a look and, you know, pull requests and, and all, you know, all the things. Issue tracker and so on is all there. And then at the end, I think we'll have five or ten minutes just to show you the, the more advanced features that, that you get with the, you know, with the product. Good. So what we're going to do is uh, look at, um, and by the way, what we're calling is policy server local, so the, the open source version. So what we're going to do is, is look at that. So the, the, the thinking is, okay, how can we now use this uh, abstraction, this decoupling of mapping into your application? So as Dominic mentioned, uh, the first approach for doing that is basically giving you a library in your application that you can call to this mapping layer to uh, establish what the application roles and application permissions are. So you'll authenticate the user somehow, take that user, call into this engine that will map this and give you the results, and it really results in a list of roles and a list of permissions. And again, these are application-specific roles and application-specific permissions. So part of the design of this, actually, um, there will be some upfront time in your application thinking about what are the roles of the users in my app and what are the, the types of permissions that I do uh, want to assign to them. Okay, so that's the first thing, is a client library, and that's just straight up using this, this, this new library that we've developed. Then the next thing is then some other techniques for incorporating that information throughout your application, and we'll see in ASP.NET Core that there are uh, a few different ways to do that. We can do your traditional authorize attribute um, or utilize the new policy system from ASP.NET Core. Okay, so this word policy does get a little overloaded, right? We have this policy server that's about the mapping, and then ASP.NET Core has policies as well, uh, and you can use those together. Okay. So the first thing is uh, what we have is a project. This is actually the code that's right up on GitHub. Uh, and we have the library here for, for policy server local. Um, this is uh, added in then to a sample application. And actually, the first thing I'm supposed to show is just logging into the sample application. We have a very simple uh, account controller where you can log in. And we're decoupled from what the identity system is. So this approach and this technique that we're showing you, you can use with any identity provider. It does not have to be identity server. It could be you know, Active Directory or, or Azure AD or something else. 
So right now we're just hard coding some users, and in our example, uh, I think Alice is ultimately going to end up with a doctor sort of uh, permissions, and Bob is going to end up with nurse permissions, uh, and uh, this last user, whoever else, uh, unfortunately falls under the patient uh, role. So we're going to have this, uh, this application where the user logs in. Obviously, to enable uh, authentication, what we have are uh, the cookie handler in ASP.NET Core 2. So then to pull in this policy uh, mapping that we're talking about, uh, we have to define these policies somewhere. And so actually, I think in Oslo, what we showed is the hard-coded version. We didn't even have JSON support at that yeah. time. Uh, but now we have this ability to uh, express these, what we call policies, uh, in, in a JSON file. And for this version, we only have you know, one policy. And the idea is that the policy allows us to define roles. Right? These are the application-specific roles. And we're going to have a, a doctor and a nurse and a patient. And we have ways to map the user from the identity system to these application-specific roles. So you could simply list the user's identifier, their subject identifier, right? That's the user's unique ID. And user ID 1 and 2, well, those are both doctors in this application. We also can map from the identity system the role of the user. So there's the centralized identity system. Maybe you're you know, a doctor in the, the centralized uh, Active Directory. They put you in the, the, the doctor group. When you get into the application, though, the application may have slightly different names for what these application roles are. So there's the identity role that gets mapped to an application role. So that's a different way to do mapping. So in this case, it looks like our identity system Centralized may call the user a surgeon, but this application just has the notion of a doctor. Okay, so we also have nurses. So these users, and uh, I guess RN is not well known over here. That's a registered nurse. Uh, that's the uh, abbreviation in the US uh, frequently for a, a nurse. Uh, and then we have uh, patients as well. So that's one way to, to do some mapping. We're going to take the identity of the user, map it to these application specific roles. We also have the notion of, of permissions. And so then the application decides uh, what are the, the, the functions that we need to protect. Right? Certain users can do certain functions, and that's where the permissions come from. So based on your application role, you can utilize application-specific features uh, expressed with, by these permissions. So some users can see patients, some users can perform surgery, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this configuration system then gets loaded in uh, to our application uh, at runtime. So we're going to start up our application. We will load our JSON configuration uh, and load it in memory and uh, use our extension method to put the services that we need into DI. And the main service that we're putting into DI then is a client library that your application can use to query for the current user which application roles uh, and uh, permissions they're allowed access to. So to access that, policy server client, the API then that we surface to communicate to the mapping engine is this thing called a policy server client. And it has a couple of APIs, right? You can see for the current user, uh, are they in a role? Uh, do they have a permission? And here's actually the main engine piece, is where you feed the user in, this is the currently logged in user, and you get back the results, which again, conceptually very simple. It's just the list of roles and permissions that they've been mapped to. It actually can also be another user if you want to. Now, it, it doesn't need to be the currently logged in user. You can sure. also evaluate for another given user in the system, which is also useful. So what we have is then um, the client, we can evaluate. for the current user, and we get back this result. Again, the result has the roles and the permissions like this. So what we'll do is we'll just pass this to our view, and we have some code in the view that will show that. Okay, so we'll go to my secure page. I'll log in as Alice, okay? Again, remember Alice from the identity system is just user ID 1 and name Alice, okay? But that goes as input to the policy system, and the policy system is simply map the user to these application roles and uh, permissions, okay? So now you have that data for that user, right, specific for your application. 
What do you do now to do your authorization? Well, you have some information right here, so you could do whatever check you wanted to programmatically. Right? You've called the system. You have some of that, uh, those results. OK. So that's calling the client library and getting that information back. Okay? Now, again, you could always write your own authorization code at that point, check for this operation that's being performed. Does the user have the particular role uh, or permission? But we're in ASP.NET Core, right? And in ASP.NET Core, um, you know, we have the, the good old authorize attribute. So what we can start to do is figure out how to take the policy system that does the user mapping and start to then use the built-in authorization features provided by ASP.NET, okay? So how many of you guys use the authorize attribute with the roles? Yeah, people love that, right? <laughs> so what we're gonna do is go have a method where only nurses are allowed to you know, use, uh, perform this action, okay? And so we can use the, the good old authorize attribute to do this. Now, right now, the current user that's logged into my system does not have that information okay, in the user's claims list. Right, right now, the, the logged in user just has a, a name, and, and we're just printing out the fact that they're mapped to this role. So to actually leverage this style of authorization, that user has to have the role claim in their, their current list. Okay? So there is a technique for taking the, the claims that are in the cookie, right, for the current authenticated user, and when the request comes into the web server, add additional claims or augment the list of claims so that the application can look there for them rather than calling this, this custom library. Okay? And so that's called claims transformation. And we have a mechanism where um, the claims transformation can use as the source of the additional claims, right, our... Um, client library uh, to map those. So what we can do is put into uh, the middleware pipeline. Right? After authentication has been performed, right? the request comes in, the cookie's read, turned into the claims principle with just the, the subject claim. Right? Our policy server claims transformation will then add those claims to the user so you can take advantage of the built-in uh, role checking that's provided. Also, if you already have existing investments into the built-in APIs, you know, like a claims principle dot find first, find all, has claim, you know, all the, the built-in claims APIs from, from .NET, and you want to keep them, that's how you would do that, yeah? So actually what this is now showing is that the user coming in uh, from the HTTP context now has some claims coming from the cookie, and now these claims that have been mapped from the policy system, okay? So now the current user does have the role doctor on the user object, and now if I go to the nurse's action, we, oh, we're, actually no, we're a doctor. Exactly, right? <laughs> so that worked. So yeah, nurses only, right? Shouldn't be allowed. So if I log out. Can I, can I do a surgery now? Can you do surgery? You should yeah, be able to. Nurses only, right, we can get in there. Okay. All right, good. Anything to add? Well, the usual, ah. a small rant at least about the authorized attribute, yeah. Um, not, not about the authorized attribute in particular, but about using it with this, in this style, right? Um, I have seen a lot of customer projects where this was extensively used, yeah, and then you have like 10 controllers and 20 controllers and 50 controllers, and suddenly you have authorized attributes everywhere, right? Role equal this, role equal that, role equal something else. Now, I think this leads to very hard to maintain code, right? Especially if your, your boss walks in and says, hey, by the way, can you give uh, 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 this random guy from the marketing department access to whatever, you have to, you know, do the, calculate the math in your head, like what's the intersection of that and that, and you have to go to every single authorized attribute, update it correctly, don't make a mistake, right? Um, and so on and so forth. So I, I, I personally don't like the approach. I totally acknowledge that many people like the approach, that that's why we added support for it, right? But um, I think it's hard to maintain. I actually have one customer who wrote a command line tool to scan all controllers if they have the right combination of magic strings over that. And I don't think you want to be in that situation, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so the main complaints are it's just hard to maintain. 
uh, you have this code maybe sprinkled in multiple locations for the same logic, right? Because you might need to have some code in the UI that hides or shows the button, and then the actual action method has to have the exact same logic to actually enforce uh, the logic. So yeah. it's duplicated. It's also the big complaint is it's hard to unit test. Yes. Right? If you actually need to unit test this, you have to run a real server and make real HTTP requests. I mean, how, how would you automate a test that makes sure you have the right roles over each controller? Yeah? It's, it's, it's not trivial. That's why, actually, um, you know, we, we've been talking to the ASP.NET Core team for many, many years, or the ASP.NET team, I should say, before they were even core, um, and showed them an alternative way of, of doing authorization. And, you know, they didn't really feel like adding that to the old ASP.NET, but now with the new ASP.NET Core, where they have the chance of doing breaking changes and, and stuff, um, they added this new um, authorization API, and it's called policy-based authorization. And, you know, kind of that's what inspired us, right? Because think of the ASP.NET Core policy API, a nice client-side API against our policy server backend, so to speak, yeah? And the nice thing about... Basically, that the policy uh, API in um, ASP.NET Core uh, solves my biggest complaints. It's, better, it, it's easier to maintain because you can centralize your policies. It is, um, um, you can have a separation of concerns between business logic and authorization logic, and it's testable. And that was my biggest you know, uh, wish, that I can somehow write automated code that, that runs on a check-in that makes sure I haven't messed up my authorization policies. Okay. So there are a, a couple of different ways to use the policy system. Uh, the first way we're going to show you is kind of a, the simpler way, uh, and uh, it works okay for demos, I suppose. <laughs> so the, the idea is that you have this idea of a policy, and there are certain uh, requirements from your user that the user must satisfy to be allowed to do whatever your operation is. So in the, the DI system, you will add the authorization services, uh, and then you can define these policies. So a policy has a name, in this case, prescribed medication. And then on the policy, you go and uh, express what you expect the user to have. And if the user has this, then they will be satisfying the policy. So I require that the user is authenticated and that they have a permission called prescribed medication, for example. OK? Well, the, the nice thing about it is, is, is that you define the policy only in one place. And if you change the policy, all the controllers will just get automatically get this new policy. Right? You can even think of putting the policies into a separate assembly and then being able to version the policy independently of, of, of the application, for example. So there are some benefits here. So in this particular example, it actually works well with our user mapping, our policy server mapping in the JSON file. Because what I'm requiring from the user in this case is a permission. So what we're going to leverage is our claims transformation from our mapping from policy server to produce the permission and then we can leverage down on the right the actual authorize attribute and the version of the authorize attribute that you accept a, a string to the constructor. That's not a role. That's now the name of the policy that you uh, expect the user to satisfy to be able to access this action method. Right? So and I think we can. And you know, the, the other thing is that there's, there's a layer of indirection here. So maybe being able to prescribe medication means you have to have the permission and something else, right? And you can bundle that up basically into a reusable thing called policy. And as you'll see in a minute, this is also extensible, so you can plug in your own custom requirements that can go to custom data stores and so on. So let's actually go back to our uh, secure page. And uh, I don't think patients were allowed to, pres to, uh, to prescribe medication. Uh, but doctors and nurses, I think, were. Actually, we could take a look here. Yeah. It would be weird if patients could do that. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. <laughs> well, they can request pain, but yeah, okay. So yeah, our doctor and our nurse should be able to now access the secure method, whereas uh, anyone else should not. So if I run this, uh, I don't think I'm logged in as anyone right now, so I'll go to secure. Uh, I'll log in as Alice. Okay. And again, we get here. That worked great because Alice does, in fact, have performed surgery. If we log out, uh, sorry, yes, prescribed medication, sorry. Log out and go now and log in as Joe. And yeah, Joe's not going to be allowed to do that. Okay. So that's nice, okay, because we've now decoupled the two, right? And we are now uh, in a little bit better position to, to maintain that code. 
One of the other, uh, oh yeah, this is actually a really nice thing about this is that um, you can also use the uh, ASP.NET Core authorization system programmatically. Instead of just declaratively, you can invoke it imperatively. So maybe somewhere in your code based on logic that's dynamically occurring, you need to execute one policy over, over another. And that's the key to testing, right? So now you can just write a unit test, you, par you, you, you create a claims principle that has the shape and form that you, that you want, you pass it into a policy and you make sure that the ex expected result comes back, right? And then if somebody changes the policies down the line, the, the test will succeed or break, right? And you will get immediate feedback if, if something has been broken that, you know, changed the behavior. So instead of doing it declaratively like that, what we could do is... Authorize, we pass in the user, and we indicate here our prescribed medication name. The most common question we get when we show the new ASP.NET Core authorization API is, oh, is there a version available for older versions of ASP.NET? <laughs> because, you know, I like it, but uh, we don't do ASP.NET Core. And indeed there is, yeah, so the, um, the link's on the slide, and you have this, uh, and, and the slides are on speaker deck. Um, there's a guy called David Parks 8 uh, on GitHub that uh, backported the whole thing to ASP.NET 4. Point, I don't know, what is it, 6, 4.5, whatever. Okay. And Web API. Good. So now we have a, a programmatic API to tap into the ASP.NET policy system, which, you know, in this case, um, is good to, to, to be able to, to achieve your unit testing. Uh, the other nice thing, then, is that you could also use this when you're building your UI. Right? You have a view model that has a flag for whether or not a button should be enabled, something like that. You populate your view model, uh, and now, again, you change the code centrally, and both the, uh, where you enforce it and where you display it will both, uh, will both pick up the change. Actually, there's even, <laughs> there's even this, yeah? <laughs> where, where you can now use dependency injection directly on views. So you could, in theory, get the authorization service directly onto your view, and then execute policies, and depending on that, render your UI. I'm not sure if I should recommend that, yeah? Um, the, 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 the approach that Brock described is much better to have a view model, right? But let, let's say you want to do stuff on the layout page, then this is maybe a handy thing if you want to you know, change the global, the global um, navigation, whatever, based on who the user is, yeah? Okay. All right. So what we've shown here is uh, in our sample code is defining a policy, okay? And then having the benefits of that centralization. And in this particular example, like I said, we are matching it well with our uh, user mapping coming from our policy server. Except one problem with this is that notice you are now basically doing a one-to-one -one mapping of the permission from our JSON mapping to a permissioned name in the ASP.NET Core policy system. Okay, and if you have 10 policies, this can start to become tedious, or 20 or, or even more, uh, or 10 permissions, rather. Um, so this becomes a, a bit tedious. So it turns out that the policy system uh, is extensible. Um, the authorization system, uh, back on the home controller, when you're invoking authorize async and you pass in the name of a policy, internally, they have a lookup mechanism to go find that policy. And that lookup mechanism is itself extensible. So you can just register an interface in the authorization system that receives this string dynamically, and then you can dynamically create a policy. So it turns out that we have that support as well here. We've added that into our uh, local, local system. So I can get rid of the manual one-to-one -one mapping of this. Which makes sense if all you want to do is just one-to-one -one mapping, right? If you want to have higher level policies, then you, you can still map them you know, statically, but for one-to-one, -one, that's just done automatically now. So we have this extension method which will register um, this authorization policy provider. Uh, and so we are, are implementing the, micro, uh, the interface defined by Microsoft. Um, we can come in here and look at this implementation. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, when the request comes in for a policy, uh, we go look to see if an existing policy is, is already registered. Maybe you've already uh, done a hard-coded policy. Great, we'll leave that one alone. Um, but if the policy uh, is not there, uh, we will look it up from our 
um, our authorization system um, based on the, the permissions for the user. So we're, we're dynamically then creating a policy requiring um, the, the permission um, that, uh, um, that you indicate in the string. Okay? And actually, we use our client library directly. So we're not even looking at the current user object. We actually call into the client library um, to, go, to go look that up. So to use this, actually, we could do a couple of things. Now that we have this and it's going directly to the client library, we no longer need to map these policies directly. And in actually, you know, fact, we don't even need to um, do the claims transformation anymore. OK. So it, it's about style, I guess, yeah? Some people, yeah. you know. That's the other thing I learned when talking to our customers is that everybody prefers a different style. So that's why we basically give you the choice. You have options. So if I run this, it should still basically work the way it was. Um, I'm currently logged in. I don't think I'm not logged in as anyone here. Uh, secure. Oh, <laughs> I need to have a basic authorized attribute. That's actually an interesting difference here. So the very first time I came in, I wanted to be denied but uh, logged in. So the first time, I want the redirect to the login page. Once I'm authenticated, then if I don't satisfy the policy, I want to be taken to the forbidden page. So that's what I was missing here. Here, um, Alice should be allowed. Great, we're in. And of course, our other user, Joe, should not be. Good. So, um, I mentioned earlier that, that the policy system is also extensible, so you just you, you don't have to just go for claims, right? So you can also um, next one yeah. um, have your own custom requirements. So basically what a policy is, is really just a list of requirements. And some of these requirements are built in, like, you know, require authenticated user, require claim, whatever. But you can model whatever you want, right? So, so let's say, for example, we have a custom requirement where we want to authorize on what kind of medication the nurse or the doctor wants to prescribe and how much of it, right? Could imagine that this is something that could be real. <laughs> um, yeah? So, you know, the code is not really necessary. Maybe, maybe just switch directly to the implementation or, or the, how to use it. But the point is now that you can create these higher level requirements. Uh, you can implement a so-called requirement handler. And this handler is invoked at runtime by the ASP.NET Core um, system. And then inside of that handler, there's a handle method um, yeah, um, that allows you to write arbitrary code. Yeah, so, on one hand, you could call the policy system querying permissions and roles, but on the other hand, maybe you need to look up some web service, whatever, to, you know, and both things together will become your ultimate authorization decision, yeah? Yeah, so this particular example, if you want to uh, be able to uh, prescribe medication, um, we'll first see if you have the, the permission from the, the policy system, and then based on the amount, we'll do additional role checking, for example. Okay. So it allows you to write arbitrary code, um, and again, you're mixing a little bit of our uh, policy server logic with a little bit of your own custom uh, application logic. Uh, this class does need to go into the DI system. So that's one last thing I need to do, is go in and add one more line of code. Okay. Then when you are trying to actually enforce this, uh, we have now a prescribed medication action method. We build up our, our requirement uh, and based, uh, we pass in the user. And based on the type of the requirement, that's what triggers um, this method to be, uh, or this correct handler to be invoked because of the, the generic argument there. And that generic argument is, again, back in the handler, passed into you, and that's where you, you get the additional data. Okay, so I broke something now. What did I break? What did I break? Ah, too much commenting out. So I think I'm logged in as Joe and Alice. Good. 
And so it was, ah, there's a link, of course. Ah, here we go, good. <laughs> it's much better than me typing it. Uh, so we have one where you can prescribe 10, 20, or a placebo. Um, so I think a nurse can, uh, can prescribe up to 10. Uh, a doctor should be able to prescribe up to 20. Great, that works. Um, but if we come in now as Bob the nurse, all right, Bob can do 10, that's great. But now 20, denied. So again, did you mention this is now, uh, since it's in the DI system, it's now testable and, and, uh, and your uh, handler classing can take any other dependencies it needs. So one of the things that's commonly, uh, you know, uh, need to be done is you might need to look up stuff out of a database, for example. Okay. Yeah, the very last thing is that um, authorization policies are, can also work globally, right? So it's... It's basically, uh, you are not forced to opt in to authorization. What you can also do is have a global authorization policy and then opt out wherever you need. Now, so, so let's say, for example, you know, like a, a very common thing is that you only allow authenticated users, uh, but that could be arbitrary complex. You have the full power of the ASP.NET Core policy system here, and you can create arbitrary complex policies, which, you know, define the shape of the user be before he can even use the application. And then you can use local policies as well, um, on top of that, okay? I don't think we have to show that. Yeah. Okay. Cool, let's go back. So, yeah. So, um, we showed this to a couple of people, yeah, and, and to get some feedback and so on. And, um, and again, keep, keep in mind, yeah, that the, 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 the ultimate uh, question was, can we create a turnkey solution, so to speak, um, for authorization? I think the ultimate answer is, you can't, yeah? No one can, because at a certain point, authorization becomes business logic, okay? So what you can do is you can definitely use a standardized or a general authorization component to define who is allowed to access my application. That's easy, yeah? That, that's a global policy. You can uh, authorize on who has access to certain features of your application, and I think, again, you have the choice of being you know, role-based, more coarse-grained, right? And if you drill into the feature, uh, like, you know, maybe, you know, 10, 10 milligram versus 20 milligram, whatever, that could be a permission thing, yeah? But once you drill even deeper, yeah, like, I don't know, now is this, is this patient actually allergic to anything inside the aspirin, yeah? Is that really authorization logic? I, I, we, we think that that's business rules at this point, yeah? That's why we stopped here. Some people ask us, can you go one step further? And then we were suddenly in the exequimal dilemma, right? Where we started to have the need of expressing business logic inside our code, where I think you are much more effective expressing it in your own code, <laughs> okay? So that's, I, I think, um, where we ended up with. We have 10 more minutes, so maybe you want to just show quickly a couple of the advanced things, which are not in the, um, you know, on GitHub, but in, right. in, um, in the UI. Right, so uh, what we have here is also then running locally. Um, I have our uh, management UI for policy server. So now this is the centralized version, if you will, of what we just demoed. So the idea is that the centralization of this uh, allows you to put your policy definitions, uh, you know, in a database. Uh, you can have an administrator come and, uh, you know, uh, if you're onboarding a new user, you can start to go to the different policies uh, for the applications that the user is allowed or should be allowed to and start to map them to these roles and permissions. Uh, but again, it's done through this, this UI. So yeah, we, we uh, uh, have our, this is our first version, if you will, uh, of our UI. Hey, we have a few policies already here that we're going to map. Um, again, these are stored centrally. So what will happen is then uh, the client library, the one that we just showed you that you can call directly in your in an MVC code, um, there's a different version you can swap in. And this different version will then connect to the centralized policy server instead. Okay? Your code really shouldn't have to change in your application now that you're centralizing this. So we have uh, one, one simple policy here. Um, modeling our, our emergency room scenario. So this is kind of our doctor, nurse, and, and patient scenario. Um, and so our management tool allows you to define roles for this application. So the idea is that you'd create different policies for each of your applications and do your mapping to your users from your, your identity system. 
So in this case, we have our doctor. And notice, um, our doctor can be assigned from some identity data. So just like we had before, the user's unique ID. Maybe in this case, it's, it's Alice. Um, if you want to do the identity role assignments, maybe, right? Uh, surgeons are allowed to come in here and do this, OK? So now surgeons are mapped to the doctor role in the emergency room. Um, another thing we have is, again, the user ID or identity roles, that's a, a good first start and that's useful. But you, know, you might want to have your own custom logic based on their identity information to decide how to do this mapping. Um, so we even allow you to, to put in an expression here. So this is actually accepting uh, a lambda expression, right? And you can actually put in a C-sharp uh, lambda here. And we actually will evaluate this at runtime based on the claims coming in while you're executing this policy. Okay? So, so in other words, you don't have to do one-to-one -one mappings, right? If you know that certain users will always come in with a certain identity claim, you can automatically assign them to roles and permissions without having to change it all the time. Yeah. So not that I'd want my sick users to fall into the doctor role, but you see that that um, is now in there. Okay. Good. So it's same same uh, mapping logic, uh, just a couple more features. So then down below we have the notion of our permissions, and same thing. You'd model the uh, the actions that a user may or may not be allowed to perform, and then based on what your roles are, you can simply indicate right if the user should be allowed to do that. Okay. So that's the, that's the simple version, if you will, very much like our JSON file. Um, again, what's maybe different about this is then it, in, it is, in fact, centralized, and we have our, our management tool as, as part of the, the commercial product. Uh, there's more, though, than this, because um, you, know, you might have this notion where, well, I might be building multiple applications. And the design here is to have a different policy for each application. It's supposed to be um, you know, application contextual. So, um, the problem with this then is that, of course, well, if all of your identity mappings are the same, but maybe each app has different permissions, yeah, it's tedious to redefine all those mappings. So we realize that if we're going to build something here that's uh, actually you know, production ready, we're going to have to have the notion of a policy hierarchy. Okay? So the idea where you can actually define a parent policy and then have a child policy that inherits configuration that you've done upstream. So this particular example actually is, is attempting to model that, where we have maybe some uh, hospital system that you're building, um, and then there are child policies beneath that. And in this particular example, the child policies represent the application. So we have a medical records application and an accounting application. Okay? They share the notion of roles and who is in the roles. So if you're a doctor in one, you're going to be a doctor in another but you need a separate configuration because they have different concepts of permissions. So what we've done here is we've modeled our role mapping at the root of this policy hierarchy at the hospital level. And so again, our doctor, we have users mapped to the doctor role. And then as you navigate to one of these child uh, policies, right, you are inheriting the notion of these roles, but this particular policy has permissions. So this is an example of the application-specific permissions. And certain users are allowed to do create uh, of medical records or whatever this represents. Okay. All right. So that's another example uh, uh, of a feature that's in the commercial product, is this notion of hierarchy in the policies. So it turns out there's another use case as well. Um, I had a customer that I built um, some authorization engine for several years ago. And they basically wanted to model uh, a scenario. Um, it was actually a, um, a fire marshal scenario where like, a, a fireman would come into a building to inspect all of the, uh, um, the safety equipment in the building. And so they had very strict rules about which fire marshals were allowed to inspect which floors of the building or which rooms in the building. Okay? So they needed to have a hierarchy to model the building and who could be assigned to the various floors and rooms and devices in that room for this inspection purpose. So that was another scenario that we wanted to be able to accommodate in our policy server. So this other example is uh, an example of the hierarchy. And it's actually sort of the inverse of the prior hierarchy. So the first hierarchy, we defined the roles at the top that were the same mapping across all applications, but different apps had different permissions. In this particular example, we have the notion of Roles in an application, okay, 
that are defined at the top, but what we're doing is we're doing the permission mapping at the top. And then down the hierarchy, the hierarchy now represents resources in, in this particular case, the hospital. So maybe a, a particular emergency room, um, you know, a particular nurse could be assigned to that emergency room, but not some other room, maybe not the operating room in the hospital. So our hierarchy in this particular example is actually modeling physical things. So there are, uh, is a, a doctor or a nurse. Uh, they have the permission to work in a particular room in the hospital. So the permission mapping is at the root of the hierarchy. But notice at the root of the hierarchy, okay, we don't have anybody assigned yet. We're just, these are just placeholders to model the, the, the roles. And then if you actually go to the emergency room, right, what we've done is at the emergency room done the role mapping. So maybe right now this nurse named Alice is assigned to that particular uh, level in the hierarchy. So again, for this particular emergency room, this person can be the nurse. Uh, maybe there's an operating room, maybe there's actually even nested you know, further hierarchy. So room, operating room one, we have uh, Bob is assigned to operating room one, uh, but maybe for a different operating room, we have a, a different assignment. So, so the point is basically what you can do with this system is also to outsource, you know, like when, when you're building an application where your users can create resources dynamically, you can outsource that permission management to, to this here and don't have to build that into your own code. Yeah, think of things like GitHub, yeah, where I can create a repo, right, and then in my repo I can assign proc push access to it, right? So that, that could be also done with the system, and that's what we had in mind here. Right. So backing the management UI here is we have an API. So the management tool is using the, the web API. This is an API that you could be tapping into as well from your application if your application was dynamically modeling these resources and doing assignments. Okay. Cool. That's it. <laughs> so if you are interested in that, well, uh, can, you, can you bring up the slide with the, the URLs again? So you can go with the URLs of policy server. Oh, do we have that? Yeah. Where? Just go on. Uh, in the middle, yes. Yeah, OK. So if you're interested in that, play around with the, the open source version. If you're interested in using that commercially, let us know. There's a, a different website with a link to a contact form and so on and so forth. And, uh, and give it a try. OK, thank you. Thanks.